Each year we welcome thousands of nonprofits to the Nonprofit Technology Conference. This year, the 12 NTC will be held in San Francisco on April 3rd through the 5th. Learn more at n10.org forward slash NTC. All right, we are back. Um, I'm Maddie Grant. I'm Social Strategist for Social Fish, and I'm here with two very special people, Melanie Mathos of Blackboard and Jeff Patrick of Common Knowledge. And Melanie is going to ask Jeff a whole bunch of good questions about the brand new social networking uh, benchmarking report. Hi, online NTC world. Thanks for joining us. And uh, thanks for taking some time, Jeff, to talk to us about the new report that came out yesterday. I know there's been a lot of buzz already in the sector about it. Um, social media is a huge topic at NTC, as always, this year. So what's the big picture for nonprofits in 2012? Sure. Well, it's a fourth annual report for the nonprofit uh, social networking benchmark report. So the good news is we're getting two big things. We're getting a look at what the trends are. And we're also getting some new data that's uh, going to be really interesting for folks to learn about this year. Well, on the trending side, what we're seeing is that nonprofits are continuing to con uh, commit really big resources, uh, sorry, commit in a really big way to commercial social networks like Facebook and Twitter. Uh, they're not necessarily increasing their budgets or their allocation of internal resources. Nonetheless, they're building their community sizes. So, for example, one of the trends that's kind of interesting is uh, the average Facebook community size is about 8,317 members from our respondents. And that's about a 30% increase over last year. Uh, on Twitter. that to? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's really interesting question. We think that it's about nonprofits learning to use this channel better that as they've each year gotten increasingly more committed to it, they have not necessarily committed a lot more uh, staffing and budget, but they're getting better at everything that's involved in building that community. Um, we know they also have figured out uh, the formula for how to be successful too, and very specifically, we asked nonprofits, what is it that's made you successful? And they told us overwhelmingly there's three things. First thing is we need to make sure we have a strategy. Second thing is we need to get executive buy-in. And the third thing is we need to have somebody on staff who's dedicated to this process. It's a very logical, intuitive thing. Uh, it's worked through other, with other types of technology, but we're definitely hearing the successful nonprofits all say that's what you need to do to make it work. And I've heard this year still a uh, continuing conversation around how do we get our executives to buy into this. Um, doesn't matter how small or large the organization is, it's more of like a cultural issue it seems. Uh, what advice do you have for nonprofits to get past that hurdle? Sure. Yeah, I mean, the, what's interesting about this when we talk to the executives at nonprofits is that they're telling us they have uh, some needs and they have some concerns. So the needs are, I need to understand what the value of this channel is going to be for our organization. They want to understand, is there an ROI? What's the cost? What's the value? And then on, and I'll talk more about that in a moment because we got some initial insights this year for the first time on those, those numbers. Uh, and then on the, the concern side is, they worry about having developed a great brand exposing that brand to what they see as an audience who's more likely to have a bigger voice in the conversation. Actually, they would frame it as an audience that's actually going to be able to say whatever they want whenever they want. So this idea of having an audience who's participating in the conversation is really, really uh, powerful, but it's also a big concern for the attorneys, for the legal folks, and for the executive management team. And the good news is that for nonprofits, there are a clear set of guidelines, principles, and best practices that help to mitigate all that and make it a reasonable place to do business. So in the end, it becomes an education process. It's new, it's different, and the executives and the legal teams don't necessarily have the experience with it, but we as an industry have to help them understand there are real answers, they're viable, and very large organizations uh, are committed to this channel and they're doing it successfully with a million plus people. And while, of course, there is uh, definitely feedback from the community, and it's not without concern sometimes. It all can work in a way that can be successful for both sides. And it really all boils back to strategy, right? The first thing you mentioned, having that policy in place up front, 
um, protocol for how you handle that type of situation and engage in the conversation in a meaningful way. Interesting. So everyone wants to know, what's the new kid on the block? Uh, what are you seeing with networks like uh, Google Plus and Pinterest? And then I noticed um, there was also an interesting change in LinkedIn this year. Yeah, so this was always this is a question we always ask is what's happening? What should nonprofits be thinking about for the future? Uh, probably worth mentioning that we fielded the survey in January into February. So we're now April, so it's been a few months. Uh, the reason I mention that is because Google Plus at that point was making a, a lot, was putting out a lot of information around, of course, their network. Uh, the first piece of information we got about Google that I think is really interesting is Google Plus for the our respondents. Uh, had about 47 members in their Google Plus community, and 23% and of nonprofits had some kind of a presence on Google Plus. So, to put that in perspective, 98% uh, of non of respondents said that they had a presence on Facebook. Facebook, and their average community size is 8,317. So, it's 23% on Google Plus versus 98% on Facebook. 8,300 8, versus 47 members. So uh, Google Plus will tell you they think they have uh, somewhere between 80 and 90 million active or registered members on Google Plus. For now, we're not seeing nonprofits adopt this platform in a meaningful way yet. We will see. Uh, the second thing that we saw is we asked the question, what's new and valuable on the horizon for you? And didn't get a lot of qualitative information around it, quantifiable information, just wanted to get a sense of where they were looking. And out of that pop Pinterest. So Pinterest would tell you they have you know 11 million uh, active or uh, unique visitors per month, and clearly they're making an impact in this industry because anecdotally we're hearing more about it. And in the survey, it's really one of the only new platforms that popped as being uh, on everyone's uh, horizon. Yeah, it'll be an interesting year to see where that goes, especially with uh, you know commerce, retail commerce, e-commerce. So another big thing this year that's new to the survey was the, the value and cost of a Facebook like and a Twitter follower. And before we jump into that, can you tell us a little bit about the methodology of the survey, how many people took it, and how you came to these conclusions? Sure. So the survey, this is, as I mentioned, is a fourth annual survey. Uh, in this particular case, we fielded the survey uh, and had 30, around 3,500 respondents. Uh, and we field it via uh, a series of different email lists that we have access to in the industry, N10's list, our list, BlackBot's list, etc. Um, the respondents are a uh, cut across most of the vertical sectors and generally include uh, respondents from the small, medium, and large nonprofits. So important to note, it's not a completely randomized survey. So from that standpoint, we have to be careful about making really large conclusions about the nonprofit industry as a whole. But having that many respondents, we do get some valuable directional information. So from that standpoint, we continue to say it's a great, valuable tool for understanding how things change from year to year and for individual years to kind of see where nonprofits or at least our respondents are hovering regarding the answers to some of these questions. And so you want to talk about the the value and uh, cost of the Facebook followers? Yeah. So the nonprofit industry is wrestling with as is the commercial sector with the question of what the CFO wants to know. Tell me why I should make this investment in people and dollars for social media. Is there an ROI? Is there a way to demonstrate payback for this? So we asked two questions to get to that answer. The first question was, what is the average cost of a Facebook follower, a Facebook fan, or a like? And what is the average cost of a uh, Twitter follower? And the answers we got are the following, that on average, our respondents said it costs them $3.50, 350 to get a new Facebook like, and $2.05 to get a new Facebook follower. We said, okay, that sounds great. When we think about campaigns that we run with our clients, we see those numbers anywhere from a dollar fifty to as high as twenty dollars. So, in the end, what we said is, seems like the right range, uh, but we're suggesting that nonprofits use that number as sort of a minimum investment level. If you want to think about truly how much it's going to cost you to get hundred thousand likes on your page, think about a multiplier of something like that, uh, three fifty. ROI is made up of cost 
and of course revenue. So the second question we asked them was, tell us about the revenue. And the way we framed it was intended to try and get sort of a, a pretty comprehensive picture. The question we asked was, what is the average value of a Facebook like in the 12 months following the acquisition of that supporter? And the implication, the, actually the explicit part of that question is, it doesn't just have to be a supporter that you monetize on Facebook, it's through any channel. In fact, we actually asked them to divide the answer into two parts. Tell me how much that person, that like, is worth over the succeeding 12 months, and tell me about the value of that across all channels. So presumably they come in on Facebook, you get them, and they're going to also go onto your direct mail list, on your email list, and you're going to be soliciting them, whatever that means, membership or other forms of uh, asking for a gift. The answer we got was the following. Uh, across all channels, so for I acquire uh, a supporter on Facebook, get a like, and then for 12 months following that, what are they worth in terms of their giving? Uh, the answer across all channels was $214.81. So let's call it $215. So I paid $3.50. They're worth $215 over the succeeding uh, 12 months. Uh, and then on only online channels, so think web, email, but not direct mail, not telemarketing, not DRTV, the answer was $161.30. So call it $160. So that really supports what we've all been preaching for a really long time, that the multi-channel uh, integrated outreach is really the key to um, the, the value you're going to get out of your online acquired constituents. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's an interesting set of numbers because all at once we ask it because we were assuming that the value is going to be lower on online channels and it would be higher on all channels. And in some ways that corroborates the fact that we were asking. And remember, this is all self-reported. We had no mechanism to reach in and look at their Facebook page or look at their particular database of constituents. They were telling us. So self-reported can be less can be less accurate. Um, that said, one of the ways that we wanted to test to make sure these numbers had some reasonable accuracy was, well, online should be less than all because all you have more opportunities to ask them more times in more ways more frequently. And in general fundraising terms, that usually means more dollars. Well, so we were glad that we saw numbers that corroborate 215 and 161. Uh, to your point, yeah, the other thing is, What's interesting is we continue to see evidence from different reports, different market research, anecdotal from clients as well that say, hey, when you ask them on more channels, you're going to tend to raise more money. And this is yet another example of that. So really, this is a, a new baseline that the nonprofit sector can look to and trend uh, along with this report annually to, to inform decisions and strategy and investment. Uh, another thing that kind of stuck out to me was that the investment hasn't increased a whole lot. So we are seeing a lot of people raising a lot of money, but the investment hasn't uh, really raised exponentially year over year. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, now what's interesting, we ask questions around budget and staffing. So budget equals dollars not associated with people. And social media is not free? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. So as we said, it costs about $3.50 <laughs> to get a new Facebook like. Um, yeah, so what we found was that uh, the, the relative level of staffing and budgets, dollar budgets, is just inching up very slowly. Let me, the, the best way to understand it is to say that when we said how many, how, what do you, what do you um, commit to by way of staffing for social media? And the biggest category is one quarter of an FTE. FTE equals full-time employee equivalent. So if maybe, you know, one quarter of a person's time they're dedicating. So among all the organizations, the biggest category is one quarter. This year, what we saw was the biggest move is from one quarter to one half FTE. So for, you know, across all the respondents of different sectors and different sizes, it's, it's, inching, it's inching up. So the good news is it's going up. The good news is also that uh, organizations are understanding they have to commit more resources. But to your point, what's really amazing is that with that small incremental change in the total resourcing for the organization, for this particular discipline is we're seeing community sizes continue to increase and we're still seeing about two to three percent of the organizations overall who are raising significant amount of hundred thousand dollars or more on Facebook for example so if you think about this over the long haul what this means is that I think what we're this report is really telling us is 98 percent of organizations say they're there we all agree we should be there two 
we understand that if we're methodical and structured in the way we go at it, we'll get better at it over time, and community sizes are going up as a result, so we're getting better at it. What the industry as a whole hasn't cracked yet is how do you raise money there. There's still a lot of discussion of whether you should raise money. Uh, public media would tell you we don't raise money there. That's where we go to deliver our content. A lot of um, cause-based organizations saying it's where we connect, where we acquire, and then we cross-pollinate them into channels where you can raise money. So there's even a basic discussion whether one should or shouldn't. Of those groups who say you should, there are definitely groups that cracked it and they're raising a lot of money. And I think what's going to happen over the next few years is those groups and hopefully people like this at this conference are going to help us all to identify that, kind of frame it up as a set of best practices, deliver it out to the industry and see broader mainstream adoption. And on that note, um, not using these platforms as a, as a fundraising um, source mainly, but more on the engagement side, I know you did some research on house social networks as well, where it tends to be more focused on the engagement, mission delivery, uh, service delivery side. Can you tell us any trends you're seeing in that arena? Sure, and I, I should probably say as a sidebar, part of the corroboration of this in the commercial side is that we ask people from a Facebook advertising. Now we're talking about real spend, right? You have to pay for Facebook advertising. What are you dedicating your money to? And by far the biggest category was awareness. And the second biggest category, uh, i.e. branding, right? Just letting people know we're out here and on Facebook. And the second one was actually uh, to build their base in Facebook, so to get a like. So part of that whole story of it's not necessarily about fundraising today is corroborated by the fact that when people are even spending hard currency to go out and, and do this on Facebook, they're spending it on the non-financial pieces. Um, on the house social network side, this is the organizations who create their own social networks. They run and own them themselves. They're probably part of their website. Good example would be a stop smoking uh, site of people who are looking to maybe a health-based organization who wants to help people quit smoking. You know, it's nice to have a private community where they can do that. They can get a mentor or a sponsor. A lot of features that bring together people who are geographically distributed, and when they're distributed, that doesn't, although they're distributed, it doesn't mean they can't help each other. So support and service allocation or service provisioning. What we found on the house social network side is that for the second year running, then the percent of our respondents who said they have one or more is 13%. So kind of static around how many new groups are picking this sort of approach up. Forget Facebook, forget being out there in public on these commercial networks. I'm going to build my own and I'm going to use it for my own purposes, often for, you know, to have privacy and other services. Uh, it's staying fairly static at 13%. But what's interesting is, even though that number is staying the same, the number of community members is going up. So. Uh, the number, the average number of community members on a house social network went from around 6,000 last year to right around 22,000 this year. That's a 265% increase. So we think what that's telling us is that there are certain sectors, think associations, think um, health organizations or women's welfare organizations where information privacy is really key. I don't want to be talking about the fact that I've been diagnosed with cancer on Facebook. I want to have a place that I can get the support and talk about that and find my peers, but I want to do it in a private community. Those kinds of applications are now sort of surfacing as the ones that have most value and worth investing in. Uh, and so what we're seeing is those groups figuring them out, using it for that, getting better at it necessarily, and growing those communities. Um, so we're expecting that that trend will continue. It's been pretty consistent over time. And what we anticipate is that um, those particular sectors will likely continue to drive this. And then within that, there's some that are also doing fundraising. So there are some groups who are actually raising money on those same house social networks. Think in that case, something like an alumni association or a professional association where they have membership dues and they can solicit those membership dues inside a community that's private password protected, but that provides a lot of service to their members. Yeah, we've seen a lot of uh, feedback from higher education organizations that are, are really starting to look at how that might be able to support their mission, so it'll be interesting to watch. Yeah. So what else can we expect this year? I know um, 
Entence having a webinar featuring you on April 13th, I believe. Um, so all members are encouraged to check that out. It's free, I think. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. And uh, so what else do we have on the horizon? Uh, what other data do you see surfacing throughout the year from this report? Yeah, it's a great question. So in this first release of the report, we wanted to make sure we painted a broad brush picture for all size organizations across all verticals in the industry. But our next step is to do two really important things this year. The first one is we actually managed to collect some case studies. So from people who responded to the survey, we said, hey, can we continue to talk to you about this? And oh, by the way, what's your particular situation all about? So in the, uh, the next six months, we're going to be once a month after April, starting in May, we're going to be doing uh, a release and a webinar that highlights that particular case study. And the idea is while this broad-based information is extremely useful, it's often really valuable to make sure we see the individual circumstances. We can learn from how they did it. We can see the best practices and get a first-hand uh, experience around what happened. The second thing we're doing is actually going to zero in on a, a, thin a thin slice of the folks who responded, and that is organizations who've demonstrated significant level of success. People who have a million Facebook fans, right? and are raising money, and are doing incredible engagement, and have six staff members can, committed to. So what it, that seems to be the profile of someone who's getting tremendous value out of Facebook, for example. Let's take a look at them. So we're going to take a, a slice of all the data, and we're going to do it for the larger, more successful organizations. And we're going to kind of cue them up as everybody can look at these folks as being the people that we talked about a moment ago. They're being successful. Let's help them to help the rest of the industry understand what they're doing that's great. And then from that, we can all learn how to do it better. Great. Well, thank you for spending some time. And uh, where can people get the report? Great. Thanks for mentioning it. Uh, it's at uh, Nonprofit Social Network Survey dot com. Nonprofit Social Network Survey dot com. Uh, and on the site, it's a free report. Uh, you do have to register to download it, uh, but it's accessible there. And if you do have any feedback on the report, we're very interested if you have questions. If you're interested in getting more information, uh, we're going to be uh, putting out the webinar series through Blackboard, through N10, through Common Knowledge, too. So check back with us. There's going to be lots more to come over the next six months that falls out of the, the actual survey in this first report. Great. And if you're in the geeky data visualization, uh, check out the infographic at netwiththinktank.com, too.